Hi everyone, welcome to module 2A of this research course. Today, we're going to dive into one of the most important parts of any research project, the literature review. If you're someone who's ever struggled with finding existing sources or figuring out how to piece together existing research, you're not alone. In this video, I'm going to walk you through step-by-step -step how to conduct an effective literature review. So, what exactly is a literature review? Literature review, commonly shortened to lit review, is essentially a comprehensive survey of all existing research and scholarly articles on a specific topic. It is one of the most important steps in conducting research. Now, you may ask, why is it so important to conduct a lit review? Well, there are many reasons. Some reasons are that it helps us gain a better understanding of the current state of knowledge on the topic, helps us find gaps and inconsistencies that we can base our research on, and helps us avoid duplication of previous findings so that we can build upon the findings of others instead. Another reason is because it helps you refine and focus your research question or hypothesis further. Let's now talk about the five main steps in conducting a lit review. The first step is to define the research topic or question. You want to first start off with a broad area of interest. So think about a general subject or field you're passionate about or want to explore. For example, if you're into AI, you could start by looking at recent advancements or hot topics that are gaining traction within the field. Once you have a general idea, it's important to narrow it down. So you want to focus on a specific issue, population, or phenomenon that you want to study. Make sure the topic isn't too broad, so you don't get overwhelmed by the amount of information, or too narrow so you, you can't find enough research on it. Then, what you want to do is you want to formulate a clear research question. This is the driving force behind your lit review. Your question should be specific, measurable, and researchable. For example, instead of asking something broad like, how does technology affect education, you can ask, how does the use of AI-driven personalized learning tools impact student engagement in high school science classes? The more focused your question, the easier it will be to find relevant sources. After you make your question, you want to make sure that you can justify your choice. You want to ask yourself, why is this question important? Does it address a gap in the current research? By clearly defining and justifying your research topic and question, you'll set a strong foundation for the rest of your literature review. The next step after defining your research topic and question is to develop a search strategy. Start by identifying the key concepts and terms in your question, then break it down into its essential components. For example, if your question is about how AI affects student engagement in education, your key terms might be AI, education, and engagement. For example, if your question is about how AI impacts student engagement in education, your key terms might be AI, education, and engagement. For key terms, don't forget to consider synonyms, related terms, or variations, like using both AI and artificial intelligence in your search. Then, you want to use Boolean operators to combine these keywords and refine your search. For example, you could search for AI and education and engagement to get results that include all three terms or AI or technology and education if you want to broaden the scope a little. For these searches, you want to select the appropriate databases. Google Scholar is a great general resource, but if you're working in a more specialized field, you want to look for more specific databases. For example, for biomedical research, you can use PubMed, and for engineering topics, you can use sources like IEEE Explore. As you're making your search though, make sure to apply filters and limits to your search results. Filters like publication date, language, and study type can help narrow things down by a lot. You can also use citation tracking to find key papers that are frequently referenced by other researchers. Now that you've developed a search strategy, the next step is to define which studies you'll include in your literature review. This is done by setting clear inclusion and exclusion criteria. For example, you may choose to only include peer-reviewed articles or studies published in the last three years. On the other hand, you might exclude studies with small sample sizes or papers and languages you don't understand, such as non-English studies. Once you set these criteria, you should do initial screening. You want to start by skimming the titles and abstracts to quickly assess whether the study is relevant to your research question. After the initial screening, you want to move on to the full text review. This is where you'll read the full text of each selected study to confirm whether it meets your inclusion criteria. 
You'll want to keep in detailed notes on why you decide to include or exclude each study. This will help you stay organized and provide a clear rationale for your decisions. Once you've selected your studies, the next step is to extract and analyze the data. Start by noting the key details from each study, things like study design, sample size, methods used, key findings, and the abstract. A great way to stay organized is to use tables or charts to visualize this information and make it easier to compare. Speaking of comparing, the next step is to compare and contrast the studies. Look for patterns, similarities, and differences in the results. You want to consider the quality of each study. As you analyze the studies, identify recurring themes or gaps. Look for contradictions or areas where the research is lacking. This is important because it helps you highlight where further research is needed and where your own work could fill in the gaps. Then you want to synthesize the findings. This means creating a narrative that ties everything together. So you want to discuss how these studies, when looked at collectively, address your research question and topic. You want to show how they contribute to the overall understanding of your question and topic and where they leave room for further investigation. Now that you've gathered and synthesized your findings, it's time to organize and write your literature review. The key here is to organize your review logically. You should start with an introduction that clearly outlines your research question and the scope of your review. Then group the studies in a way that makes sense, whether that's by themes, methodologies, or even chronological order. Next, you want to summarize the key findings from the literature, provide a clear and concise overview of the major contributions to your field, and make sure to highlight the most important studies and their relevance. After that, discuss the implications of these findings. Explain how they address your research question and how they relate to the broader issues in the field. This is where you show the significance of the work that has been done. You should also identify gaps and suggest further directions. Point out areas where existing research falls short or where further investigation is needed. Mention any limitations in the current studies that could be improved upon in future work. Finally, conclude with a summary. You should recap the main findings of your review, reiterate why your research question is important, and end by emphasizing the need for further investigation and what future research could bring to the field. Let's now discuss how to differentiate between credible and non-credible sources. A credible source has certain qualities to make it trustworthy. First, it's typically peer-reviewed, meaning experts have assessed its accuracy and validity. It also provides author credentials so you know the information is coming from a reliable expert. Credible sources always cite reliable references and strive to be objective and unbiased. Lastly, they have a clear publication date, which you can use to ensure that the information is current and relevant. A non-credible source typically has several red flags. It might lack peer review, meaning it hasn't been evaluated by experts in the field. The offered information could be clear or unreliable, and the source might cite questionable or no sources at all. Another big indicator is bias. If the article presents opinions as facts, it's likely not credible. Lastly, look at the publication date. Non-credible sources often have outdated information from years ago, or worse, no publication date at all. When you're looking for credible sources, there are a few reliable places to start. First, like what was mentioned before, you could try out peer reviewed journals, as the articles have undergone rigorous evaluation by experts in the field before they're published. Peer review acts as a quality filter and makes sure that the researchers' methodologies and findings are sound. Examples of some include Nature and IEEE transactions, and you can usually identify peer review journals by checking if they mention their peer review process in their submission guidelines, and many have an impact factor that reflects their influence in the field. Another thing is to use academic databases, which are curated collections of research articles from peer reviewed journals. Examples of that include Google Scholar, PubMed, and IEEE Explore. These databases help ensure that the sources you access are credible and reliable, and you can use advanced search filters to filter for peer reviewed content. Lastly, you can check out reputable publishers like Springer and Elsevier, which are known for maintaining high academic standards. They have stringent peer reviews processes and editorial oversight, which adds credibility to the works they publish. Books, journals, and articles from these publishers are often cited frequently in other academic literature, which is a good sign of their reliability. Now, here are some examples of non-credible sources. First is blogs, which are personal or group one websites where opinions or unverified information is often shared. Blogs typically lack peer review or editorial oversight, which means they can be biased and inaccurate. So while blogs can be helpful for getting 
a general sense of a topic, they should never be relied on for factual data or thorough analysis. Next is Wikipedia, which you can use cautiously. While it's a free, crowdsourced online encyclopedia that provides a good overview of many topics, anyone can edit it. This open edit nature can lead to inaccuracies, vandalism, and a lack of rigorous citation. Wikipedia can be a good starting point to gather general information or find sources in the references section, but always verify what you find through peer-reviewed sources. Another example is non-peer-reviewed articles. These articles haven't gone through the peer review process, meaning they haven't been scrutinized by experts in the field. As a result, they may contain unverified or speculative content. Use these articles cautiously. They can offer new ideas, but always cross-reference with peer-reviewed sources to validate the information. Lastly, be careful with commercial websites run without citations. These websites run by companies or organizations often have the goal of promoting a product or service. The risk here is bias, as the information may be skewed to favor the company's products or agenda, often without proper citations or supporting evidence. Use the sources rarely and always look for corroborating evidence from credible peer-reviewed or academic sources. Now, let's talk about some tips I have on using academic databases. Here are some general search tips. First is that you can use quotation marks to find sources containing the exact phrases you need. Another trick is to use an asterisk to find variations of a word. For example, typing compute will bring up results for words like computer, computing, and computation, which will help you capture a wider range of relevant studies. When using PubMed, one of the most powerful tools at your dispensal is MeSH terms, which stands for Medical Subject Headings. These are standardized terms used to index articles in PubMed, making it easier to find research that's directly relevant to your topic. To use effectively, first, start with a basic keyword search in PubMed. Once you find some relevant articles, take a look at the MeSH terms listed for these articles. These terms are carefully selected to describe the key topics of the study, and they can help you refine your search by using more precise terminology. You can also directly use the MeSH database to find the most appropriate terms for your specific topic. By selecting the right MeSH terms, you'll be able to narrow your search and get more targeted results, ensuring that the studies you find are highly relevant to your research question. As you do your literature review, you'll often come across articles hidden behind paywalls. So now, we'll discuss the potential considerations and ethics to have when dealing with these articles. When you first encounter paywalled articles during your research, there are several legal ways you can access them. First, check if you have access through institutional subscriptions. Many universities, schools, or research institutions subscribe to academic journals giving students and researchers free access to these articles. If you're affiliated with an institution, this is one of the easiest and most legitimate ways to access paywall content. Another option is to search for open access journals. These journals publish articles that are freely available to the public, bypassing the need for subscriptions or fees. Many researchers choose to publish in open access journals to ensure their work reaches a wider audience. Lastly, if the article is still behind a paywall, you can try contacting the author directly. Authors are often willing to share their work if you reach out to them and explain that you're conducting research. Most authors will gladly send you a free copy of their article, especially if you're a student or an independent researcher. So now let's talk about Sci-Hub. Now you may ask, what is Sci-Hub? So Sci-Hub is a platform that provides free access to millions of paywalled research papers by bypassing publisher restrictions. While Sci-Hub democratizes access to research, it's important to be aware that it operates by bypassing legal paywalls, which has led to ongoing debates about its ethics and legality. Many researchers and underfunded institutions rely on Sci-Hub to access important information, but it also raises concerns about copyright violations and the impact on publishers. So here are the pros and cons of using Sci-Hub, as Sci-Hub has both advantages and disadvantages that you should consider before using it. On the pro side, Sci-Hub democratizes access to knowledge by making research papers available to everyone, regardless of financial barriers. This is especially helpful for researchers and underfunded institutions or students who don't have access to expensive journal subscriptions. Sci-Hub also plays a significant role in supporting access in countries where researchers may not have the financial means to afford the high costs of academic journals. However, 
There are important cons to keep in mind. First, SciHub violates copyright laws, which could potentially have legal implications for users depending on where they live. Additionally, using SciHub reduces the income publishers rely on to maintain their operations, which can affect the quality and sustainability of academic publishing. If you're considering using SciHub, it's important to keep ethical guidelines in mind. First, consider alternatives before turning to SciHub. Always exhaust legal options like the ones discussed before first. Second, it's important to have an awareness of the ethical and legal implications of using SciHub. While it provides access to important research, it operates by bypassing publisher restrictions, which can affect the broader research community. By using SciHub, you're participating in a system that undermines the financial model supporting academic republishing. Ultimately, be mindful of these considerations and, where possible, opt for legal access to support the sustainability of research. Now, here are some practical tips I have for effective literature review. So one of the most important tips I have is staying organized. You can use tools like Zotero, EndNote, and Mendeley to help you sort, organize, and format citations effortlessly. You can even create folders for different sections of your research, tag sources with keywords, and even generate citations automatically in your desired format. This helps you stay on top of all of the studies you're reviewing without losing track of important information. Another tip I have is to have annotated bibliographies. They are a great way to deepen your understanding of the literature you're reviewing. It usually has four parts. You first cite your source and then follow it with a summary, providing a quick overview of the main points. Then you include an evaluation of the source by discussing its credibility, relevance, and quality. Finally, you end by adding your own reflection on how the source contributes to your research or how it fits into the bigger picture. Using annotated bibliographies not only helps you organize your thoughts, but it also makes sure that you critically engage with the material, which makes it easier to synthesize your findings later on. Now, here are my concluding thoughts. Conducting an effective literature review is an integral part of the research process. It not only helps you understand the current state of knowledge on your topic, but also ensures that you are building on credible and relevant research. Remember, validating the credibility, relevance, and ethical integrity of your sources is essential to ensure the quality of your review. By critically evaluating your sources and synthesizing the main findings, you contribute meaningfully to the academic conversation and lay a strong foundation for your own research. Thank you for watching, and I hope this video has been helpful in guiding you through the literature review process.